Make no mistake about it, behind the scenes, the banking system is getting worse, not better as we speak. This is Kaiser Johnson with Liberty and Finance, and this is the Miles Franklin Weekly Special from May 9th through 16th, 2023, while supplies last. This week, we are excited to feature the 2023 Australian Silver Kangaroo at just $4.85 over spot. The 2023 Silver Kangaroo from Australia are renowned for their four nines fine purity, as well as their recognizability and design. Like many other coins, they come 25 to a tube. However, unlike others, the Australian Monster Box is just 250 coins, making it the most affordable Monster Box available, especially with a premium of just $4.85 over spot per ounce. And finally, Silver Kangaroos are IRA eligible. If you'd like to learn more about a Precious Metals IRA, an IRA holding assets in a private depository rather than a bank or brokerage, call us and we'll be happy to help you in that process. To order this special or any of the many other options we have available, call us at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237. We're available after hours and on weekends, and we look forward to speaking with you. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is Peter Grandich from Peter Grandich and Company. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Always a pleasure, Elijah. Well, it's great to have you today. Um, I did want to discuss the metals markets. We're seeing a bit of a pullback here. Uh, Silver around $24, it dipped below there this uh, morning and uh, gold still holding up above uh, 2000 right now. Your perspective on this pullback right now, what should uh, investors in precious metals be thinking right now? Well, I think you can't lose sight, uh, especially with gold that we're at a 2000 number. And you know, round numbers sometimes get people one way or another. You also have to realize that we continue in the paper market to work against a crowd that has, for a lot of years, many decades, profited mostly from the short side. And there's a big difference between the paper market and the physical market. I think people have to recognize that. And uh, whenever the market is at highs like it has been here in gold, silver has been off its lows, but the gold is the real target normally uh, you're going to see them show up. Now, we used to argue for years, some of us that were on the, the speaking tour about how the market was manipulated. And there were a couple of folks that would call us tin fort hat, hats and there's no such thing. And then, of course, over these last several years, we've learned that there were many manipulators. Many have been already tried and convicted. And uh, so that continues to happen. It, it, there's no question about it. You can see the way it trades. But I think the big difference this time around, Elijah, and it's probably somebody like you could testify to this more than even me, is when this happens, physical demand actually increases. It's not like suddenly people in the physical market join the sellers and say, look, get rid of my silver and gold. I want out. They actually inspire them to own more. And it's tipping more to the point where the physical will override the paper market. They will not be able to continue this. And, And two main reasons. One is the continued uh, accumulation by central banks of, of gold. We've now argued and seen why part of the reason why China's been such a big buyer, because they're best basically introducing a plan into their, their country where their citizens are going to be buying gold uh, on a fairly regular basis, and, and they've incentivized it to, to be such. But we're also seeing uh, the BRIC nations seriously talk about an alternative. It, again, today, as we speak, Several of the spokespeople for some of the leading countries have brought up the fact of they're in deep discussions about an alternative to the U.S. dollar. So while it, it gets frustrating, and I think part of the thing that adds to the frustration is those same people that are frustrated, they own mining shares and junior resource stocks. And there it's really even far worse than uh, the pullbacks we see in gold and silver. And And there's a frustration, but also keep in mind that we're really in a negative market overall. The general equity market's in tough shape. I'm sure you got questions about things like the banks and the economy and all. So it's not an, it's not a bullish environment. So it, it, you're going against the tide uh, being bullish on something. So all in all, I have a long-winded answer. I still think gold and silver is attractive now as any other time since we started speaking. Yeah, and it's good to remember also that 
nothing goes up in a straight line. We often see little bounces here and there, and it looks like this may be just another bounce. Obviously, we can't guarantee that or anything, but you do mention the fundamentals we're seeing out there with the BRICS countries uh, making uh, talk, talking more about moving away from the U.S. dollar. Um, we're seeing uh, the issues in the banking system. We're also seeing this issue with the debt limit that seems to be approaching very soon. Whenever I hear that, I'm just like, oh, this is just theater, you know, because every time they raise the debt limit, um, if it's the Republicans in power, the uh, Democrats are saying, oh, this is a terrible uh, thing. This is irresponsible to uh, raise the debt limit and stuff like that. If the Democrats are in power, it's the exact opposite. It's just theater to me. Do you see that the debt ceiling issue is anything more than theater right now? Well, it always has been. If you stop and think, would we as parents If we told our kids to stay within a budget and 88 times they didn't listen. And of course, we violated by letting it go and raise their budget. They're going to just keep taking advantage of that. Kids, that's how kids are. Once they realize mom and dad's no is really not a no, they take advantage. Well, the same has been here in Washington and really didn't matter who was in charge, Democrat or Republicans. The debt ceiling was created supposedly to spend off what at that time seemed to be runaway uh, debt exposure, which is trillion, tens of trillions of dollars ago. And so you're right, it's theater. I'm a little concerned on this. I'm a little concerned that because the hatred now that exists between both parties, I mean, it's hatred. I mean, at least back in 2008 and nine, as much as the Republicans and Democrats disliked each other, they managed to go in a room and come up with a half-baked idea. I don't think they can do that now. In fact, they just left Washington without uh, doing anything more on the debt limit. And we're talking about literally just a couple of weeks away from where it could hit. So there, there is a more likely chance that we have one of those brief periods where both play Russian roulette or chicken and n- neither one uh, blinks. But the bigger picture about it is, is what's happening with the debt, even if they do raise it again. How do we go about supporting interest payments on debt that the CBO now says is going to be $50 trillion in less than 10 years? It's 32 now. How do we service that interest rate expense? And what conceivable thought could anybody come up with that we could ever pay it off? So what's the inevitable? And if the dollar does lose its reserve currency status or weakens to the point where there are other competitors, the advantages we've had uh, by getting away with raising debt is going to be no more. It, it, it's, a, it's a no-win situation, Elijah. And that doesn't mean you run out and you, you put every single thing you have in gold and, and buy uh, a cabin in the woods and all. But it, it, it's inconceivable to me how the, the don't worry, be happy crowd, which makes up most of the financial service industry, can speak to people with anything of long-term horizon and not include these things as a real concern. Wall Street treats gold like it's uh, kryptonite. I mean, it's not made up of part of portfolio, never, never. And and I'm not saying it because you're interviewing me. I'd be saying this if it was my old days and I was back on CNBC again. How you don't have gold and metals as part of your portfolio now with all these issues that we haven't even begun to discuss, I think is doing a disservice as a financial advisor. And that's why uh, I remain hotly bullish because I know to bet against the don't worry, be happy crowd, not on them. When it comes to also the issues we see in the banking system, um, your perspective on that is because since the last time we talked, we saw another uh, bank uh, get bailed out, I guess, by the FDIC and JP Morgan, their first republic. Um, your perspective on that and this new trend that seems to be that all deposits are going to be insured. That's very dangerous. It's beyond dangerous. And first, let me address the Jamie Dimon situation. Uh, he he cherry picked the deal. He got to take what was good of the assets and the government gets stuck with the bad assets. And the government is us. It's not, it's not a separate people. It's the taxpayers. It's us. But why the uh, insuring all deposits is, is a horrendous thought. And if it's imposed, I think it just opens Pandora's box as wide as possible is Think about this. You and I have the first bank of New Mexico and uh, we're getting in depositors and we look around and go, hey, you know what? The worst case scenario, Elijah, is if we lose the depositors money, government's insured it now. Come on, let's buy soybean futures. 
Let's do some crazy things. Let's lend money to anybody. Goes under, our depositors are protected. Uh, that has not been discussed in all of this. And keep in mind, the people now that you want to insure are the people that can most afford to lose money, not the least can afford. The whole concept of the hundred and two hundred fifty thousand was to cover the small working person that they don't get hurt in, in the banking thing. Not somebody that, you know, like Governor Newsom in the crisis when, when SVB went. He's calling Washington because he's got $9 million in the bank from his wine, uh, wine vineries. I mean, that's not the people that the whole reason for the deposit insurance was up. And let's face facts. There's no conceivable way the United States could ever back all the money that's in savings. And can I make another point, if you don't mind, that's not being discussed? I, it's probably been discussed, but not openly in the regular media. With all the money moving to money markets out of banks, that's very bad for the economy. See, because when it's in banks, banks lend out that money. You know, it, the average deposit turns over two, three times it's lent out while that money stays there. And that's what helps and moves the economy. When it goes into money market funds, it just sits there. And, uh, you know, it's some of the money market funds will go out and, you know, lend corporate paper, note, but it doesn't have the same dynamics that money in deposits. And we continue to see deposits leaving banks and going into money market funds. So I don't see how the banking crisis goes away at this point. I think we're going to continue to see it. And realistically, it's something like 70% now of, of the major deposits are sitting within four or five banks. I mean, I, I think there's a new member on the Federal Reserve Board. His name is Jamie Dimon. I mean, you're going to have to these guys are going to be included in when the government makes decisions because they're going to have so such influence and so much of the money in the country. It does seem like we're seeing a consolidation, obviously, of the banks. And if we continue to see regional banks having issues, that seems to be the playbook as you just, you know, have one of these big banks uh, take it over. What are the ramifications of that consolidation? Well, the big one is in real estate because and, and, and small business loans, I most of my work is with small to mid-sized business owners, and they don't have accounts with the JP Morgan at all. They have it with their local savings and loans and local banks and all, whether for commercial real estate or, or business loans. To, those are the, the banks that are really pulling the strings now and having to tight. And we have such a big turnover, ironically, coming over the next 12 to 18 months on real estate loans that are due. We're seeing a big problem with the uh, office space not being rented, 20% uh, of rents are not being paid now uh, in, in, in office spaces. I mean, these are all issues that are going to compound this situation. And, you know, the Fed got away with not getting as much spanked as it should have, as far as I'm concerned. Because remember, they first created all the money. They should have known what that would lead to. Then they missed the inflation. They used that word transitory. Then they slammed on the brakes and never thought to think, well, how is that going to impact the other banks? And then their supervisory position overseeing it was laxed. And now those same people we're counting on as the, as the situation gets worse to handle it. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not a I'm not very high that we're going to come out of this without a, paying a very serious price. And all the media can the, the financial media tends to be tied to the major financial networks who are tied to the advertising dollars. Make no mistake about it, behind the scenes, the banking system is getting worse, not better as we speak. And in light of that, uh, how do people react to that? As you mentioned, you know, going into money market funds might not actually be the best for the economy, but what is going to be the best for the individual at the moment, understanding that we can't give financial advice? Well, everybody each to their own. Uh, I always say this about gold. Even when I was bearish on it, it's still a worthy thing to have as insurance. You want to own it and hope it doesn't go up. And I say this all the time. People used to say to me, why do you want me to buy something that you think is not going to go up or shouldn't go up? Because I would tell them if it goes up a lot, what you mostly own has probably gone down a lot. But the one thing that it also offers that a lot of people don't talk about, but because of now what's happening, I think they should. It's the only investment that I know that isn't a liability of somebody else. Because even the treasury bills, and even the money market funds, it's a liability. They have to make good uh, to give us our money back. 
uh, I don't have that situation uh, in the gold. So I still find, uh, Elijah, and again, I, I, I know it's going to sound like a plug for your business, but I would say this no matter who is speaking to me is, I still find American portfolios seriously undivested in gold. Uh, some people say it's a half of 1%. I don't even think it's that. I think we can go into most financial service firms, look at their books and see that for every 100 clients, maybe one has some sort of exposure. And I have to say this, and this irks some people, owning GLD is not the same as owning physical bullion. It's just not. I don't, I don't have anything against owning both of them, but I want to own the physical bullion first, especially in these days. Then it's okay to put some money in things that are paper related to gold. I think that's very key because even these ETFs are have counterparty risk in some sense. Obviously, if you hold the gold in your hand, you know that there's really no counterparty risk there. I did want to ask you uh, more about the economy here because um, we are also seeing a real issue, as you have mentioned, about commercial real estate, um, people not going back to work. So there's all these buildings. And how do you think that will impact the banking sector? Well, that's a bigger of the problem. There's no question that people, COVID caused a, a, a dramatic change in how people work. There are many people I know that got used to working from home and no way, shape or form want to go back to, to an office in any shape. There's another issue that, that needs to be addressed. It's becoming more difficult to work within a big city. Lawlessness in major cities is seen all over now. People are really concerned. I'm about 90 minutes south of New York City. And people I know who used to go into New York City for everything, business, um, medical reasons, uh, entertainment and all, just don't. They just don't because you know I was talking to a, a good friend that owns a limo service, and that's dramatically down. People are just not taking those trips. And now with the problem with what I call it the invasion, and I'm not the only one of people, uh, borders being overrun, uh, we're now seeing those cities having difficulties managing people in New York City now, or it's been so overrun that New York City is shipping the people to the suburbs. I mean, it's, it's there's a lot of there's not a lot of good reasons to be bullish, and and I get, that's why I still want nothing to do with general equity markets. Uh, but this this whole issue compounds it when you start to think that these office look we, we're seeing office space in San Francisco being sold for one quarter of what it was just 10 years ago. I mean, that's that's unsustainable if that starts to, to move into other major cities. People can't afford those type of losses. At one time, commercial real estate was one of the, the main things to use to, to increase wealth, but it, it, it's not the easiest thing anymore. And uh, I think it's going to remain challenging. And we don't know to the extent if we start to see inability to service the debt that people have commercial real estate, how that actually enhances the banking crisis. And, and, and I'm still afraid that that's a serious possibility that can still occur. Right. Because the main issue we're seeing in the banks right now are them holding long term treasuries where if marked to market, they'd be very much under what most of the banks would be under. Elijah. You're at, you're at, I'm glad you made that point. I meant to say it. This not being able to market, mark the market is is what's saving these banks right now. Most of them would be dis, dis, dissolvent right now because they have serious losses. Yeah, definitely. That's a lot more banks out there that um, would be insolvent. Yes, and and when it comes to the commercial real estate, it seems like maybe a similar issue um, if they had to sell those assets at, at this moment. Well, well, the other thing that I didn't like in in in, in my planning, especially. With seniors, they were huge buyers of real estate investments trusts because of the dividends. They had to seek dividends to support a lifestyle they got used to, and they couldn't find that anymore in the bond market. Well, those real estate investment trusts have the same issues that the banks that are holding the paper do. And we're now seeing some of them unable to pay a dividend, one big one at Blackstone and several others. And if the commercial real estate really starts to tank, that too is going to be an issue. And then the third one that again, many on Wall Street aren't speaking about is a lot of the uh, dead on on dead corporations were refunded during the COVID crisis. The, bank, the Fed gave and bailed out corporate paper that should have gone under. Well, those companies now are, are back in that situation. They're, they're, they're seeing a struggle to stay afloat. And the Fed is in no position to, to buy their debt again. And so that will just 
add to the potential and we'll start to see corporations having to cut or omit dividends. And again, that causes a whole bunch of issue who are people who've grown to a lifestyle, as I've always said in my planning, about seven out of 10 people in America at all levels of income and all types of professions, I find a living at least one or two lifestyles truly above where their true finances support. And they've not managed to do that through uh, debt and, and, and taking risk that had paid off in speculating in markets and all may not now. So all these things are coming together for a near perfect storm and a storm that should be really concerning to most investors. What we've seen over the last couple decades is easy money policy. And then finally, the Fed is reining that in. They're being hawkish and we're seeing all these cracks in the system. I know I just interviewed John Rubino, um, uh, formerly from dollarcollapse.com. And he was talking about how we saw this CPI uh, data came out. We're seeing lower rates of inflation. um, And that is signaling to people that, oh, maybe the Fed is going to stop raising rates. And he said, you know, even if the Fed stops raising rates, we're still going to see the effect of these elevated rate hikes. Companies and banks are going to have to rein in credit uh, just because of what's happening right now. Your perspective on that, is it uh, easy sailing from here if the Fed stops raising rates or do we still have problems ahead? Well, I think there's a whole generation of investors and so-called professional advisors who were weaned on that one-way street. You know, the Fed provides ample liquidity, interest rates near zero, and everything's hunky-dory and you buy because the Fed always, they, they always have the put option, so to speak. I don't think the Fed has that anymore. doesn't mean that by, by stop raising rates, there'll be some relief, but I don't think they can get into the position anymore of providing the insanity of liquidity. Think about it. Some estimates that the Fed was during COVID, as much as 70% of the purchases of the paper that they were issuing themselves. In Japan, it's 100%. I mean, Japan is really the only buyer of their own debt. And, you know, that, that's a sophisticated Ponzi scheme in my book, okay? Uh, so I just think all these things and other issues make an attitude of being a live chicken versus a dead duck is the way to go here. Uh, I, I still don't feel there's any reason for me to own anything in general equities that aren't related to some certain commodities. I think the bond market in terms of treasuries and high grade bonds is the lesser of two evils. But I don't want to own things down on the corporate level or junk bond levels. And I think real estate is is very challenging. It was an area that one time I liked, but in the last few years, I would not be involved in it or suggest anybody. And I just think this is a time that it, doing doing next to nothing is better than doing a lot. And we haven't even touched on the politics, both here and abroad, of what's happening. The polit- politics is something that the younger advisors not have any experience assessing geopolitics and how that impacts us. And it is impacting us big time, both abroad and locally. And so, like I said, is... I like to be more bullish, Elijah. Business would be a lot busier. It really would, but I just don't see any reason to. I think one thing that we haven't touched on uh, today, and I-, I love to touch on this with you every time we have you on, is kind of the, I guess, the spiritual side of this. Your perspective on kind of how a lot of this stuff seems to be connected to kind of the degradation of, you know, ethics and morality uh, in the financial system right now. So I wear my. Catholic Christian face on my arm. It does generate grandage haters on the internet. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm only really concerned of what my Lord and Savior is going to think of me, not what anybody else does. So to answer your question in the fairest and most objective way is, I'm a true believer that much of what has caused this issues is, is a demonic spiritual warfare that has reached unbelievable heights. Uh, I would say that anybody's grandparents or great grandparents who've long since passed away, God rest their souls, would come around and see how we live now and day to day and what we see each day from all this changing uh, little children's sexual beliefs uh, to just a, a whole attitude of uh, men who are biological men competing against women. I mean, These are all things in my book that are 
demonic in nature and are part of a spiritual battle. And that spiritual battle has led to what you said, ethics and morals being, you know, torn up. And, uh, you know, things that I realized as a 67 year old man that I wouldn't even think at 20 to do because I'd be so concerned of what my father would do to me if I if he heard how I behaved or whatever, or did something against some law enforcement officer or something. These things now have really changed society. And here's an important thing that if you are in the camp that I'm at, it's now estimated about half of America is either atheist or agnostic. That's just a fact of life. So one out of two people are not going to think from a spiritual way that you and I may be thinking. And because of that, they will have much different views, especially since they think everything is finite. This is this is it. So, you know, all let all, so to speak, hell break loose. Who cares? This is it. And for those that don't believe in that, there's something more that we live for and all those come together in many different ways here now. And uh, it's it's never going to be spoken in the financial networks. I mean, I I can assure you that there's very few places that will have this conversation that you and I are having. But for those that do believe in, 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 in a God and, and an afterlife and all, uh, you have to take that into consideration that you're battling not only uh, actual spirits that are against you, but half the people are not going to believe as you believe, no matter what you say or do. And, and, and that, that's a big change. And, and that is moving more that way than coming back and coming around. I mean, I would love to say there's going to be a great revival and, and all, but, you know, the, there are a lot of people. We're not supposed to talk about end times if you're spiritual because it says not even Jesus knows the time or the day. So how could I possibly know it? But clearly, if you're a believer in the Bible being something more than a historic book and being a manual to life, the last writings in it, points to uh, a way that things are supposed to happen. And some could argue several of those things are appearing before our eyes right now. And I, I think the, you mentioned how there might not be like a revival or anything like that. I think the, the hope for that is that, it, you know, the way to do that is for it to start with the individual, right? To take responsibility for yourself, for your own household, for your own finances, for your whole own everything, right? And live based on you know virtue and integrity uh live in a life filled with integrity instead of mirroring what's going on in the world whether it's socially or uh the financial world and stuff like that we have to be an example to others um living that integrity well there's a great biblical saying that, that teaches us to be in the world but not of the world and being of the world is a big challenge it's been a challenge for me as much as i try to keep my faith because I'm involved in matters of money and finance. I have sinned. I have done things that, you know, I've put them in my book, you know, and shared about things that, you know, would, would be considered sinful. And anybody that doesn't think they're a sinner, well, they're really going to be <laughs> a big surprise. But uh, but the bottom line is you're right. And uh, it does start. But, but, uh, but I've also accept speaking like this for every hater or, or hate mail that'll come from it, eight or nine others will say in some way, thank you, if not directly, some do, uh, but it will just help them. And, and, and that's the big challenge now. You know, one of the other troubling aspects in America right now is, is, is mental illness. It is paramount. If, if it's not in your family, it will be. And if it's not you, it's going to be somebody you love. And it, it's a big strain on how People are being impacted now. The COVID made it worse because people were placed inside and there was great fears, which now were being seen were unwarranted. But uh, all of these things and then looking, you know, it's, I don't know how you can watch news and not get depressed. I mean, just so I've decided that I just don't want to really watch it in any way, shape or form. But uh, you're right. Uh, in order for it to be a revival, we have to start with ourselves and, and, and how we conduct ourselves. And I see that. I see that from interviews that we've done. Yeah, there's a few people that write and say something nasty, but then there's people very thankful and actually say it, it helped change their mind and gave them hope. And that's the greatest thing you, God gives you is hope. Uh, I can't imagine going around in life and being hopeless. I can. Uh, it, it must be a terrible thing for people that don't have a belief in 
something something other than themselves that can, that can come and help whatever their issues may be and also hope is a great thing but even more important than hope elijah is thank god god is merciful because if he wasn't merciful we're all dead that's definitely true well peter we really appreciate your time today any last thoughts before we let you go and where can our viewers find you online well, there's a petergranish.com website. I like Twitter. I spend a lot of time on it, but I am very grateful that you gave me this opportunity to speak this way. This is, uh, we, we got to talk about things that are important, but I think the last several minutes is probably the most important thing for, um, in my eyes that we could have spoke of. So thank you and God bless you. Of course. And also I'll put a link in the description with our, uh, of our interview with also you and Dave Sucky talking about uh, your firm regarding financial planning. Definitely uh, viewers, anyone really interested in financial planning, um, getting your finances in order and everything like that. Um, it's not finance. We don't offer financial advice, but they'll bring some great insights and also, uh, discuss uh, more about what Peter offers there with his partner, Dave Sucky. Um, Peter, thank you once again for joining us today and God bless. Thank you, Elijah. God bless to you too. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we can let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days you will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly, with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Kaiser, my brother Elijah, or my father Dunnigan, Call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.